Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. This episode is brought to you by Skillshare. The oh my god, you can't see it. Um... Yes. Hey guys, preemptive like, original link to the video, top of the description, seven minute video. Quick little thing. I really know almost nothing about uh, Australian history. A little bit around World War II or World War I. See, I, uh, Captain James Cook. So a nice little overview would, would uh, do a lot for my Australian history knowledge. Hope everyone's doing well over, from Aus over there in Australia or anywhere from around the world. Hope you're doing well. Let's learn. Most 500 viewers who sign up using the link below get two months of Skillshare absolutely free. Aristotle, Ptolemy, and Macrobius believed that there was far too much land in the Northern Hemisphere and that there must be some undiscovered continent balancing the globe somewhere in the South. Okay, so the logic was a little flawed, but during the Age of Discovery, the search was on for Terra Australis Incognito. Fast forward a few centuries to the East Indies. Three Dutch sailors landed in Australia accidentally in the 1600s. The mythical Southern continent had just been found. Love Sweeney, great channel. Did I say original link to the video, top of the description? Below that link to the Discord, love to have you. If I didn't, there I said it. Australia was the last of the new world to be discovered, because let's be honest, nobody cares about Antarctica. Australia was of <laughs> course already Penguins. inhabited. Indigenous Australians, also known as it, had a population of between 300 and 700,000 by modern estimates. Early contacts with these tribes were as often peaceful as they were violent. It is thought that these groups arrived in two stages. The first was from the Indian subcontinent via a land bridge that connected Australia to the island of New Guinea, bringing with them the Pama Nyuangan language family. The second wave was much later and may have been groups related to the Austronesians of Indonesia. Their culture and history was preserved through the oral tradition. The Dutch named the island New Holland after the county of Holland in the Netherlands, but it wasn't until the British landed on the east coast and named it New South Wales that Europeans began to settle. Landing in Port Jackson on the 26th of- Seems like so many places, hopefully I'm not over overstating this, but uh, it seems like so many places around the world were originally like New Holland and then became, whether it be, you know, English or, or, or port I, I don't know, but clearly uh, the Netherlands were one of the first in the game of exploring around the world, but uh, didn't have the resources or manpower or military strength to hold on to those places. And I find that interesting. A lot of places were originally January, South Wales, New Holland or New Amsterdam. Europeans began to settle, landing in Port Jackson on the 26th of January, 1788. <laughs> New York, for example. Hey, that's today. The so-called I need to shut up. Jesus Christ. On the east coast and named it New South Wales, that Europeans began to settle, landing in Port Jackson on the 26th of January, 1788. Hey, that's today. The so-called first fleet arrived to found the colony of Sydney with the intention of using the labor of prisoners to achieve wealth for Britain. However, contrary to Australia's convict founding myth, less than half of this first fleet were actually convicts. In the 1800s, Australia was circumnavigated, mapped, and new colony. Yeah, why does Australia get that like stereotype when I, I think pretty much every overseas colony of the British, you know, they, they sent their uh, a lot of convicts or people out there. So actually interesting. In the 1800s, Australia was circumnavigated, mapped, and new colonies started springing up all over. Hobart, Newcastle, Launceston, Port Macquarie, Brisbane, and Melbourne with dozens of penal centers. Adelaide and Perth were founded as free settlement cities, but the latter was made into a penal colony after it failed to grow naturally. As the Europeans expanded, the frontier wars began with the Aboriginals, many of whom were hostile to the foreign invaders. Most famously, the Black War of Tasmania, which nearly wiped out the indigenous Tasmanians. But far more destructive to the Aboriginals was smallpox, which killed tens of thousands. They also weren't... Uh, I, I, I have two questions now. My first was... I, I, for some reason, I... Wasn't the boomerang more kind of ceremonial or like to throw at like birds and trees, but was it actually used in man to man in like in combat? And how would it come back? Australia's the average. And, and my other thing was uh, 
I understand how North and South America, native North and South Americans were not uh, exposed to smallpox and other diseases that were around in the old world. Um, but I, I would have thought that they, they would travel to uh, Australia, but uh, I guess it had the same effect. They weren't um, inoculated or... Originals was smallpox, which killed tens of thousands. Australia's growth would stagnate until the 1850s gold rush, which drew hundreds and thousands of settlers from New all Zealand around the world in search Australia. for wealth, particularly in New South Wales and what would become Victoria. This would forever change Australia's character, with new free settlers overshadowing its convict past, bringing with them their ideas of European enlightenment, the American self-determinism, and the Chinese hatred for the British. These gold diggers became discontent with the corrupt and badly run colonial elites and rose up in rebellion in the infamous Eureka Stockade. These settlers were beginning to feel a sense of nationalism that perhaps Australia could be something different. The winds of change were on Terra Australis, and soon large-scale trade unions developed in Australia's largely working-class population from the ideas of orthodox Marxists. Trade unions still hold a significant influence Marxist. over Australian politics today. But let's not forget the rift that had been forming between Australia and Australians, the government and its people. Feature history, Thousands great channel. of ex-convicts were being released each year, most of them turning to civil jobs, but a sizable minority turned to Australia's bushy frontier for freedom. Wait, hold on. So were there much more convicts sent to Australia than other colonies? Now, now I'm confused. But a sizable minority turned to Australia's bushy frontier for freedom and profits. Policing was harsh, but order couldn't reach far enough. Outside of the cities, only personal gain yeah, and Australia is freaking huge. Enforcement. Money would change hands and lips were sealed. In this climate, an Australian icon was born. Ned Kelly, famous for his tin hat, Robin Hood thievery, infamous for his cop killing and town raids, and recognizable everywhere for that nifty bullet. That's research. terrifying. For more on one of the most well known cornerstones of Australian folklore, go to my channel, Feature History. Thanks, and Feature History. My video Love on him. Old Ned. Okay, so besides bulletproof suits or whatever. Most Aussie colonies were granted self-governing status and united to form the Commonwealth of Australia in 1901, a dominion of the British Crown. Melbourne, uh, Melbourne, 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 ah, Melbourne and Sydney couldn't agree who would be the capital. So Canberra, which is uh, about halfway in between, was selected instead. I did know Canberra as well as Brasilia and Brazil. Um... Wondering if for the same reason for Rio de Janeiro or Sao Paulo. If, but I know Brasilia and Canberra are, are two examples of capital cities built to be a capital city. The new Australian government was in 1901, a dominion of the British Crown. The new Australian government was very quick to open up a new dark chapter in Aboriginal history, the infamous Stolen Generation. Beginning in 1905, the government began rounding up half-castes, a term which is now highly offensive, and settled them into white families with the intention of breeding out their Aboriginal blood in a form of cultural genocide. Abuses of these children were also rampant, which is a rather depressing segue into the White Australia policy, a set of strict settlement acts which restricted immigration from anyone who wasn't British or Northern European up until about the Second World War. I'm seeing a whole lot of similarities between the U.S. history and the Australian history. A lot of similarities. As a British colony, Australia would unilaterally declare war on Germany during the First World War, forming the Australia and New Zealand Army Corps, Anzac. or ANZACs. The young nation was sent headfirst into war. Around half a million soldiers volunteered, or nearly one-tenth of the total population. The baptism of fire came during the Gallipoli campaign, Turkey? where more than 8,000 men Ottoman? lost their lives in the failed invasion of Turkey, an event etched into the memory of the Australian zeitgeist. Although crippled from the Great Depression, Australia again took up arms in 1939 to support her mother nation in the Second World War, this time fighting in Europe, North Africa, the Pacific, and South Asia. Prisoners of war in Malaya. I didn't realize uh, I, until, I guess pretty recently, like a year ago when I was learning more about Pacific War, how closely Japan got to invading Australia. 
I didn't realize that. Burma and Thailand were treated inhumanely by the Japanese, who also bombed Australia's northern coast about oh, 100 and they times. Bombed them. Australia is still a very young nation, but it has emerged a very powerful force in the region, now a beacon of democracy, social progressivism, and commerce, with its phenomenal urbanization consistently ranked among the world's most livable cities. Walking the line between left and right with generous social programs, universal suffrage, a welcoming immigration policy, and attractive business prospects. This is John. John wants to learn how to play the didgeridoo he bought from a garage sale. But the lessons are expensive, mm. so John will probably give Add. up. But wait, John, you can learn for free over at Skillshare. Guys, make sure any of the videos I watch, but right here, um, if you're interested in this and you heard it here, make sure to use, and you're interested in Skillshare, make sure to use their promo codes, links, Super important for them to get uh, advertisers original link to this video, top of the description, where you will find those links, guys. In just 17. And, and I'll play this, but um, I very much think that Australia's uh, zenith, or, you know, is, is very much in the future. I think that you guys have an extremely bright future. Uh, you've had a great past, and you're great in the present, but... So much land with not that much people. You're removed from a lot of the world where a lot of problems are. And uh, I think you'll be seen as sort of a haven for decades, if not a century or so to come. So let's finish it up with this. Love y'all. Hope you're all doing well. In minutes with Paul Carlos, you can take a beginner's course in the didgeridoo. Skillshare is an online learning platform where you can learn a new skill with more than 20,000 courses in design, business, technology, and more. John's friend Sally wants to learn how to animate a kangaroo, so why not this lesson on After Effects by Kurtzkosakt? And the great part is it's all going to be absolutely free for two months for the first 500 viewers who sign up using the link below. John and Sally made the right choice. Join them in just minutes a day to learn a new skill. Support the show on Patreon to vote for the next episode or download some of the artwork used in the videos. Thank you for watching. Until next time. Great video as always, right? Um, hope you guys are all doing well. Would appreciate any comments. Would love if you liked and subscribe. Completely free. And hopefully I'll see you guys next video. Bye, guys.